One bit of evidence is far from conclusive, but many bits of evidence are a lot more convincing. There is a system that is in place to all the gold here, so there's the Sherbet Zone, but there are also these peripheral systems which are primarily hosted in volcanic rocks. So I'm going to be taking samples of those volcanic rocks, the ores, and the alteration, and I can do stuff with chemistry, with scanning electron microscopy, polarized light microscopy, and chemical isotopes to determine the relationship to the Sherbet system. Any one of these could point to the direction, but all of them combined is a pretty strong thesis. The scope of these peripheral systems are pretty far beyond the Sherbet system itself, but if we can determine that it was in place by the same driving force, that means that the size of the system is actually much larger, because if in one area the gold is in place by the same thing that emplaced it in the other area, that means that the system goes in between and there's much more to it than just the Sherbet system. The Sherbet itself, it extends downward into the mountain like a plane, like just it runs along a fault shear zone. But there are also other places to the east hosted primarily in volcanic rocks, which are also running gold. So I'm looking at those as well as the volcanic rocks found deeper underneath the sherbet itself. Because when we drill through sherbet, if we go deep enough, we find volcanic rocks with gold. Now go far enough east, those same volcanic rocks just without the sherbet system on top. The alteration inside the volcanics underneath the Sherbet system looks very similar to the volcanics to the east of the Sherbet system, which does make me hopeful that it's part of the same system. The larger the system, the more gold it is. And if it's one big system that reach underneath all of the rock units, then you could understand that you could expect all of the rocks between there to have some degree of alteration, some degree of gold, some degree of mineralization. The main thing that they show is uh, that the fluids responsible for the gold-silver mineralization that we see at Sherbet uh, in the main zone are of magmatic origin and uh, they originated at a depth of about five to seven kilometers below the paleo surface. Having a magmatic origin, some type of intrusion that could potentially be a porphyry intrusion at depth that could feed mineralized fluids through several of these shear zones is very high now that we know that we actually have some kind of magmatic body driving these fluids. We can tell that the fluids that have been entrapped are very close to a critical density. And what that essentially means is the critical density is one of the most optimal fluid states for the dissolution of, say, gold and silver. So if a fluid at a critical density uh, is responsible for mineralization, that means that that fluid could carry as, about as much gold as it possibly could. The fluid inclusions from both of these quartz, um, that's shown by the annotated figure with vapor CO2, liquid H2O, liquid CO2. That shows a very high amount of CO2 in the fluid. And that's very important because you can't get CO2 dissolved in a liquid in that high of a quantity unless you're at a very high temperature and a very high pressure. Meaning the liquids that are preserved here, which we believe are also related to the mineralizing fluids, um, they had to occur uh, temperatures well north of 300 up to 400 degrees C uh, and a pressure that would be five to seven kilometers underneath the paleo surface. That change in phase is often what precipitates out stuff like gold and sulfides. It's a really good result. It brings us a few steps closer to actually understanding more about the Sherbet system. Obviously, having a big magmatic intrusion, having something like that in depth, uh, that has the potential to provide fluids, not just for sherbet, but for for other similar shear zones, similar mineralized horizons as well, is, is obviously a great result. If it turns out that the, the fluids themselves are coming from a porphyry system, well, personally, I think it's, it's going to be even better because it, uh, it increases 
the the chances of actually finding mineralization even more, which means the mineralization might not necessarily be confined to these shear zones anymore. We might have a porphyry sitting somewhere under uh, the deposit that could be fairly easy to access. The idea that, you know, there's still kilometers below the Sherbet system to uh, be explored for potential mineralization is quite exciting. When we look at uh, our system in this light, it brings into focus uh, analogies like the SNP mine. Uh, we can draw many conclusions with that deposit to ours uh, geologically, structurally, and also for uh, what drives those systems. If it is an intrusion-related gold deposit, as our research would currently suggest, that opens up a lot of exploration opportunities for Goliath because not only could the mineralizing fluids go along other pathways that just haven't been discovered yet, but there's also the potential of there being other mineralizing intrusions. We have a series of, uh, of targets that we know the existence of already that show similar mineralization, similar textures, similar mineral assemblages as what we have at Sherbet. But uh, we we also have the mineralized corridor that, uh, that we identified uh, going from roughly from Sherbet uh, for four or five kilometers to the north and to the south and uh, that ties in with the gold swarm zone and in that zone we have signs of gold mineralization that has been confirmed with stream sediments um, but now that we have this information from the fluid inclusion study and we we know of the origin of these fluids we can dive in more and uh, do more targeted work and try and figure out if there is any additional shear zones within this corridor of mineralization that we see